it is the microvasculopathy that accounts for about 80% of the costs associated with type 2 diabetes. Now, we heard a very erudite presentation about treatment inertia a few moments ago. And there are many factors that may contribute to this delay or inertia in treatment intensification. Underlying pathophysiology, complexity of pharmacological regimens and the use of regimens that aren't necessary, necessarily complementary, conservatism in terms of the treatment approach, and of course, adverse effects. One of the major adverse effects that's important to consider is hypoglycemia. And from a patient perspective, fear of hypoglycemia, particularly severe hypoglycemia, is ranked at the same level as developing blindness. And this, of course, drives health-related behaviours. Reduced therapy adherence, reduced titration, defensive eating, etc. Another factor that is important in terms of the personalisation consideration is body weight gain. And this is a study that I was involved with a few years ago. Between 1995 and 2010, body weight gain in the UK population has been over 6.5 kilos, greater than that for the Health Survey of England. So you're seeing nearly one stone in body weight associated with type 2 diabetes weight gain. And this has a variety of implications. Reduced treatment adherence, reduced quality of life, an increase in resource use, and a detrimental effect on cardiovascular risk factors. So this takes us on to the concept of personalization. And I tend to agree with some of the earlier presentations that guidelines are not necessarily helpful in terms of targets. We are getting a bit of guideline fatigue. And really what we should be thinking about is a composite in terms of the personalized strategy. Now this is a study that we published some years ago now looking at the quality adjusted life years gained in relation to a 1% reduction in HbA1c set in the context of varying degrees of increase or decrease in hypoglycemia and varying degrees of change in body weight. The maximum increment in quality adjusted life year gained per 1% reduction in HbA1c was seen when that was set in the situation of a body weight reduction and a reduction in the risk of hypoglycemia. So from the personalization perspective, my view on this is that let's forget about targets, but let's think about reducing A1C in such a way that the, it is associated with a treatment regimen that gives us weight gain or weight, body weight benefits and a reduction in the incident risk of hypoglycemia. Now we have lots of different treatments available. You know a lot about the DPP-4 inhibitors and the incretin-based therapies, and these basically tackle the core pathophysiology of hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes. In addition, there's data with vildagliptin, for example, suggesting that this may also be associated with an improvement in insulin sensitivity. From the perspective of the DPP-4 inhibitors, there are very little in the way of head-to-head -head data. So what we have to rely on is meta-analysis of clinical trials. And by uh, looking at these data in terms of study sample size and baseline HbA1c, we get the notion that the efficacy from the A1c perspective with vildagliptin is at the upper end of that you would expect from a DPP-4 inhibitor. And indeed, the efficacy of DPP-4 inhibition with vildagliptin, for example, has been shown in the real-world setting. Patients with metformin monotherapy given either vildagliptin or an alternative OAD, SU, TZD, alpha-glucosidase inhibitor, etc. The efficacy was greater with vildagliptin across all baseline HbA1c levels. And I think this slide really illustrates this concept of personalization in real-world clinical practice. This is data for metformin and sulfonylurea versus metformin and the DPP-4 vildagliptin in the context of RCTs or in the real world. Now with an SU, what happens is that the reduction in A1C from any baseline in the real world is less than that seen in a clinical trial setting. Whereas with a DPP-4 inhibitor, what you see in clinical trials is what you get in clinical practice, the same efficacy. 
And what this illustrates, really, to me, is the issue that we struggle with in terms of optimizing metabolic control. And that is, we don't treat to target, we treat to acceptability or tolerability, and in particular, hypoglycemia. Now, another area where personalization and target achievement is really difficult is those patients with renal impairment. And there's plenty of mechanistic considerations that would potentially support the utility of the incretin-based therapies with respect to renal outcomes in type 2 diabetes. Now, there are only two classes of drugs that we can use across the entire spectrum of GFR, and that is exogenous insulin and the DPP-4 inhibitors. Now, DPP-4 inhibitors will require either reduction in dose, a reduction in dose frequency, or no change in dose. Now, the issue with uh, dosing DPP-4s in renal impairment is really illustrated quite nicely by the Vildagliptin data. DPP-4s have a very wide therapeutic window in terms of the toxicity, very much unlike, say, gentamicin, which is a very narrow therapeutic window, right? Now, what you have with a DPP-4 inhibitor such as vildagliptin, in the context of renal impairment, if you use 50 milligrams BID, you get a small increase in the Cmax concentration, which is miles away from the toxic threshold. However, what you get is an increase in the terminal half-life. So, therefore, you get the same DPP-4 inhibition with half the dose. So, what that translates into is sustained glycemic efficacy with 50 milligrams once a day, for example, with vildagliptin, as you would see with 50 milligrams twice a day with vildagliptin in people with normal renal function. The only difference being related to the advantage in terms of reduced acquisition cost. And the efficacy data is just illustrated here. And again, this just highlights the utility of the DPP-4 inhibitors in terms of meeting that personalized challenge of achieving a reduction in glucose control with a minimized risk of hypoglycemia and body weight change. And just to suggest or support the concept that these are safe treatments, because we may be talking about efficacy, safety is also important from the personalized perspective. No evidence of any adverse safety signal. And indeed, there is a suggestion, and this is some proof of concept data, with vildagliptin compared to, met, to sulfonylurea in addition to metformin, with glycemic equipoise over eight weeks, that there may be a potential benefit in terms of the natural history of nephropathy as manifest by albuminuria. Cardiovascular safety is also a very important consideration, and that was discussed in great detail earlier on. These are CV safety studies with relatively short median exposure in a high-risk group of patients with the primary objective being to demonstrate non-inferiority in terms of the primary narrow MACE end point. And that's what these studies have demonstrated, with some debate still going on about the heart failure issue that came from the Savatimi study. If we look at some vildagliptin data, again, large numbers of patients from the clinical trial pool supports the fact that the point estimate is exactly where you'd want it to be with a 95% confidence interval well below that upper 1.3 threshold that is considered by regulators to be unsafe or result in some anxiety from the CVN point perspective. From the heart failure perspective, again, this is meta-analysis of those vildagliptin clinical trial data that we presented at last year's EASD meeting, illustrating that, yes, there are a small number of events in the clinical trial program. These are adjudicated, but the point estimate suggests no evidence of an increase in heart failure risk. However, the confidence intervals with respect to this analysis are actually quite wide, suggesting that the number of events from this data set may not necessarily be large enough to give us detailed uh, evidence around heart failure. But to summarize what I was going to talk about, I think DPP-4 inhibitors are actually quite an important treatment option in terms of delivering personalized outcomes in type 2 diabetes. 
and they do so by targeting the key pathophysiology in, in terms of alpha cell and beta cell dysfunction and by delivering this therapeutic glycemic lowering efficacy with reduced risk of hypoglycemia and body weight change this is the key to addressing clinical inertia TPP4 inhibitors can certainly overcome this clinical inertia and support this notion of optimized, individualized patient outcomes. And what I've tried to show you very briefly is a snapshot of the extensive clinical trial and real-world data for this class of drugs as exemplified by some of those Wildegliptin experiences. Thank you very much for your attention.